C Sonic, the heart of your system. I'm Neil Wood for Kit Guru. When Zalman got in touch to offer us two air coolers for review, my initial response was actually surprise. I bought a Zalman product called a Reservator. It was an external CPU cooler. Ooh, 15, maybe even 20 years ago. Had one or two bits over the years, but a long time ago. The name I thought was in the past. But here is the evidence that Zalman lives, the South Korean case and cooling company, I think is the best way of describing them. What I've got here, the Zalman CNPS 17X and the CNPS 20X. CNPS stands for Computer Noise Prevention System. We'll come to that in a moment. It's to do with the fins and the fans. And the two coolers respectively are rated at 200 watts and 300 watts. When I was at CES and I went to see Be Quiet, I walked in as uh, Steve at Game of Nexus was wrapping up and he dragged me into the very end of his video, very kind of him. I didn't appreciate he'd just been doing a complete rant about TDPs and such like. So using the words rated at 200 watts and 300 watts, it actually gives me a bit of amusement. I'm going to think of these as the smaller cooler and the bigger cooler. That's a safer way of going about it. Oh, so what we have here is a single tower cooler with a single 140 mil fan, obviously Zalman's own, while the 20X is a dual tower cooler with two 140 mil fans of the same model, uh, rated up to 1500 RPM PWM. And we've got RGB going on in the fans. The coolers look interesting enough, but on the box of the 20X, we have this very bold claim, the world's best CPU cooler with 4D patented corrugated fin design. World's best, I mean, really? Also the corrugated fin design, yep, that's interesting enough. That is apparently a way to straighten out the airflow and keep noise down to a minimum, which is fine. And obviously we'll see about that in testing, but world's best, big, big claim. The two coolers have a superficial resemblance in that the middle third of those corrugated fins is copper, the top and bottom being aluminium. However, the 17X has five heat pipes connecting the cold plates to the cooling tower, while the 20X has six heat pipes. Also, the bulk of the 20X means on our AM4 test platform, you have to use a slightly different arrangement of mounting brackets, but we'll come to that later on. The two coolers look interesting. They're priced sensibly with a 17X at 50 pounds, 20X at 70 pounds. That in particular looks like a very competitive price for apparently the world's best cooler. There are also some interesting claims about the technologies that are used. So we've got the 4D corrugated cooling fins. I mean, 4D, yeah, but none Nonetheless, the, the fact they've gone for this different fin arrangement is interesting. That is a patented technology. Zalman also has a patent uh, called reverse direct touch heat pipes to do with how the heat pipes are clamped when the cooler is assembled. As to how well or otherwise that works, we will see during testing. And then we have their 140 mil PWM 1500 RPM fans, which uses a system called dual blade impellers. You can see they are basically two sets of fan blades, short inner blades, longer outer blades. So the outer blades look quite conventional. The addition of those shorter blades, that's quite unusual. So there's, there's more going on here than you might first expect. Certainly there are some claims, he says pointing to the box, that need investigating. To test the Zalman 17X and 20X, we're using an NHD15 as the obvious comparison for air cooling, it's rated around 220 watts, but never mind the actual number, it's got a blooming good reputation. Pricing for the Noctua is around about 80 pounds, so it's in the correct ballpark. Also using a Deepcool Castle 240EX all-in-one liquid cooler, priced one penny under 100 pounds. When James reviewed the Deepcool Castle 240EX, he rated it quite highly, gave it 8.5 out of 10, so it's a decent 240 AIO. Our test platform consists of an AMD Ryzen 9 3900X, motherboard is Gigabyte X570 Aorus Elite, and memory 32GB of G-Skill Trident Z Neo DDR4 3600MHz. This platform may look familiar, it's the same platform I used when I was recently doing DDR4 testing for that Trident Z Neo. Graphics card is a Founders Edition RTX 2080 8GB, SSD is a 1TB WD Black M.2, and the power supply, which is obviously a critical component for this uh, testing, Seasonic Prime Platinum 1300 watts.
I had a conversation with Luke about CPU cooling, and we have both found that Intel processors often respond best with an all-in-one. We think it's to do with the patchy nature of the core arrangement in the CPU die, and an all-in-one can direct coolant to the hotspots. AMD CPUs seem to be much more uniform in their nature, and that's a good thing. That means an air cooler can really strut its stuff. This should make for an interesting comparison on this test platform. All four coolers are in with a fairly even chance of success. To test the coolers, it was necessary to lock down the processor setting. So I ran two profiles in the BIOS. The one is essentially stock. That is with the processor running at 4.1 gigahertz on 1.3 volts. The LLC means it's actually more like 1.25 volts. The other mode was overclocked to 4.25 gigahertz with 1.35 volts uh, V-core, and that was LLC high, which meant it's 1.325 volts. Part of the reason it's necessary to use manual settings and to set a BIOS profile and then reload that profile to make sure we have absolute repeatability is that utilities reporting CPU power draw frankly don't do a very good job with Ryzen 9. So while we were seeing numbers of around 115 watts for CPU package, it's very likely the power draw is actually more like 140. What counts is the platform was entirely repeatable from one CPU cooler to the next. Another key factor is fan speed. To ensure the PWM curve didn't come into the equation, I used an add-in NZXT fan controller. For the stock settings, I locked the fan or fans, depending on the cooler, to 1000 RPM, and for the overclock, I went for 1500. The fact that the deep cool cooler actually has the capability of running its fans 1800 RPM fell outside the parameters for this test. The other three coolers all had 1500 RPM fans, so I went for 1500 as the max rating. The critical point here is the playing field is level. I ran three different benchmark tests to stress the CPUs and see what those coolers could manage. In each instance with the CPU, the Ryzen 9 3900X at stock clock and at overclock. The easiest of the three tests was 7-zip uh, version 19. Simply ran the benchmark until the CPU temperature had settled down and then saw what the temperature was. Head and shoulders above the rest of the air coolers was the Zalman 20X. The Deepcool 240EX performed slightly worse, about one degree. The Zalman 17X did surprisingly well. I was disappointed by the Noctua D15 in that particular test. However, all the coolers did a perfectly decent job. There was no problem with any of them. Stepping up to a CPU render in Blender, this is the BMW render, and the Zalman 20X once again doing very nicely. Deepcool 240EX also good. Noctua D15, not bad at all, but certainly warmer. Zalman 17X was uh, doing worst of the lot. It was quite clear that Blender was pushing the single tower Zalman uh, over the edge. Noctua, on the other hand, was being pushed fairly hard. The real surprise comes in the Ada 64 stress test. Now, this is a synthetic test. It's a nasty, nasty thing to do to a CPU and a CPU cooler. In a sense, all the coolers passed this test. However, both the Zalman 17X and the Noctua D15 suffered with the overclocked settings. The Zalman 20X did really nicely, as did the Deepcool 240EX. In this test, the Zalman 20X is essentially a 240mm all-in-one. The Noctua D15 was running quite a lot hotter than the Zalman 20X. You're talking 7 or so degrees Celsius hotter. That's significant. Those test results are quite impressive, and they speak very well about the Zalman 20X and fairly well about the Zalman 17X. So... Is the Zalman 20X the best air cooler in the world? Well, in terms of performance, it's certainly right up there and it beats the D15. Of that, I have no doubt. There is, of course, more to a cooler than simply how well does it cool. You've got compatibility with uh, motherboards and coolers. You've got the mounts. You've got RGB you've got the installation. In terms of RGB, the Zalman fans have RGB on them. The Noctua has no RGB whatsoever. Obviously, we know perfectly well many people buy Noctua because it is anti-RGB. If you don't want RGB, you don't want the cables or the mess, then that's uh, a distinct point in favour of Noctua. If you like some RGB, 
in the case of the Zalmans, is essentially free of charge. The deep cool goes down a slightly different route. There's no RGB on the fans, although deep cool does sell RGB fans. However, the pump body has quite a nifty RGB effect going on, so you can have RGBness above your CPU. That's clearly a whole different setup though, because that's a liquid cooler rather than air cooler. Installation. The different companies take a slightly different approach. With Intel, you're always going to have a backplate of some sort. For AMD, sometimes you use the stock backplate, sometimes you use a replacement. In the case of Zalman and Deepcool, you're replacing the plate. In uh, Noctua's case, they are using the stock plate but it doesn't really make a lot of difference. The mounting hardware is similar in each instance and we had no difficulty with any of the cooler brackets. Where we did have some fun and games was installing the actual coolers themselves. With the Zalman 20X, getting a screwdriver between the two cooler towers was tricky. This is the screwdriver that I used, would you believe? It's a very long snap-on screwdriver, cost me about 25 pounds a long, long time ago. There is an alternative. It is this. This is what you get with a Noctua cooler. And it's quite clearly just a piece of bent wire with a Phillips head on it. It works absolutely brilliantly and it also works with the Zalman cooler. Why Zalman doesn't include a tool like this, which will cost no money whatsoever, is completely beyond me. So that's definitely a black mark against Zalman. It's definitely a pro in favour of Noctua. In the case of the Zalman 17X, that's pretty much irrelevant because the screws go either side of the tower and you've got reasonable access with the screwdriver. Where Zalman has really let the side down is in terms of the two screws that attach the cooler body to the mounting bracketry. You've got two screws, they drop in these holes here, however they are not captive. In the case of this single tower 17X, it's not such a big deal. You hold it in place, you put in the screw, you put in the second screw, you nip them up, you're all good. On the other hand, if you're working inside a case and the case is vertical, that's not so easy. You need it to be horizontal to make life uh, relatively straightforward. In the case of this dual tower 20X, getting the screw in there like that from the edge when the thing is on the bench is reasonably straightforward. You can go there and you can go around. If you're working inside a PC with the case vertical and you're trying to go down through the towers, it's almost impossible. We've had something similar in the past with Be Quiet, uh, with their Think Generation 3 coolers and the ones before. Uh, they had to update the mounting mechanism quite uh, significantly. And our advice to them for years was copy Noctua. For goodness sake, copy Noctua. What Noctua does works, and it really does work. Zalman, in that respect, has let the side down. The final little bits for hardware, they only have to do a couple of small things, include a screwdriver and make these screws captive and that would make a monumental amount of difference. To wrap this up, the Noctua D15, it's perfectly okay, but it's definitely getting a bit elderly. Obviously no RGB, you pay a premium for the name and for the product. Uh, the bulletproof reliability is clearly a major factor. It's an elegant product it can be improved on. The Deepcool Castle 240 EX, I would say James called that one completely correctly. That cooler impressed me. It performs better than I expected. It looks good, installation straightforward. So well done, Deepcool. The Zalmans, well. The 17X, yep, that's perfectly okay. 50 quid might be a little bit steep for what you get. It does a decent job. I thought it was all right. The 20X, the performance is stellar. Absolutely, completely blew me away and was completely unexpected. Installation, it could be improved, it really could. I want a screwdriver in the box that can get between those two uh, towers and I want captive fasteners for the two screws. Apart from that, basically it's fine. Yes, you've got a certain amount of cable mess, but then you've got two fans that have RGB, you've got two PWM connections. There's gonna be mess, that's just inevitable. So it's good. And the fact that Zalman has essentially come back from the dead as far as I'm concerned, I don't know what they've been doing for the past 10 or 15 years, but they've just reappeared with these products. So hurrah, this is excellent news. Something that shakes up the cooler market, I totally applaud. 
and a real surprise to me, a very, very pleasant surprise. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up, hit the bell button, subscribe, return to KitGuru, watch our videos, head over to kitguru.net, read our reviews, look at our photos. I'm Leo Wood for KitGuru, this is the Zalman CNPS20X, and yes, very possibly, the best air cooler in the world.